<laughs> He's on, so. Oh, I didn't know! <laughs> you you didn't jerk off. You gotta we're tell just, us we're back! We're I know, it was time, I was just gonna message him. <laughs> Elroy Aiken! Hey, how's it going? Great, oh, how God. are you, brother? Hey, pretty good. I hope old Slamborghini turned a fan on. <laughs> Never, bro. No, there's no fan in here. <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't even spray in there. He's just letting it all leak into him. His bathroom etiquette is awful. Awful. Uh, I just uh. uh, piss like a racehorse. That's, that's all that was. Oh, so man. You smell like the zombie apocalypse. That's what I always figured. Just stink like a sack full of assholes everywhere you went. <laughs> There's a fucking dead bodies walking around everywhere, and it's it's just going. Oh, jeez! And the, and of course the garbage isn't picked up, and the, and then there's all the food that's gone bad in the refrigerators. That's the thing that people don't realize. It's they, going to stink. It's gonna. Jesus. I never thought of that myself. The crows are gonna have a field day. <laughs> and the seagulls. A lot a lot of people really do fantasize or want like a zombie apocalypse. Uh, yeah, they... don't you? No, no, why? no, because they, because it's gonna smell. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> going to smell, you're probably gonna have to brutally kill one of your family members. <laughs> well, yeah, fun. I kind of want to do that anyway. So, <laughs> are gonna be fun and games. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're gonna have trouble finding food, and then when you do find food, you're gonna have to eat with that smell in your nose. What about like yeah. cigarettes and beer? That's gonna be hard to find. Yeah. Especially all the beers gonna be warm. Yeah, you can make your own. Slambo, Slambo's gonna open a brewery. Slambo's in the bathroom gin. It's gonna be <laughs> exactly. I made it out of my. Oh, you don't want to know. He squalls it himself. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You don't hear of too many preppers doing. Uh, what do they call it? home brewing and all that? You think they'd be into that? Or the whiskey? Yeah. Get the get the liquor going. Well, I mean, uh, the whole thing with beer is it started because you couldn't keep bread over the winter. I mean, it'd go bad. So what they did was they made liquid bread with benefits. <laughs> That's all beer is. Yeah. It all started that way thousands of years ago. They just kept it around. So it's like, well, damn, damn, it's winter. We're going to starve. No, we got this stuff here. It's like liquefied. It's good. You feel good. Thousands of years ago in Iraq. Liquid lunch. <laughs> Liquid lunch. That was it. <laughs> How have the book sales been, uh, Elroy? Have they been good? Yeah, well, we're tootling along. It's slowing down a little bit because I need to get that third book out there. But my whole life's been fucked up this year because, uh, well, sold a house and then bought a house and... Then had to fix up the house and all kinds of... I, yeah, I don't even have to say I have, I, 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 I I have seen that you've been busy. I see your Facebook posts every now and then, and it yeah. seems a, a lot of moving. Because I was going to ask, too. I know it's a trilogy. I didn't know if, if the third was done yet or if you were waiting to drop it or if, if you were still writing it. Oh, actually, I uh, had a nice long drink about it, several long drinks about it, and uh, decided that uh, I just had to, like, change course right in the middle. You know, it just wasn't working out. Also, uh, I want to work out the final boss in such a way that, you know, since this is the last book, I've just got to do something. I've, actually, I've got to do several somethings that are real over the top. Nice. Uh -huh. Yeah, the one that I'm working on now that I'm real proud of is... Uh, yeah, there's there's going to be they're, they're going to end up in this uh, they call it the redoubt. It's basically where all the rich people went. You know, this is a question I'm looking to answer. Where did all the rich people go when the zombies rose from the grave? Well, they went to places like uh, Jackson Hole in uh, Wyoming. You know, where nobody else is. And uh, you know, they're they're going to have people there who are actually fat. I mean, obese, and they're going to be laughing at all the survivors they bring in to do all their shit work for them. Wow. I mean, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, one of the ideas I had was I was going to ram sticks of dynamite up their asses and fling them by a trebuchet <laughs> to a stone wall that I need to blow up anyway. <laughs> Just the idea of these big, fat, naked women tumbling through the air with, you know, <laughs> little trail of, you know, a little curly cue of smoke following behind because they're tumbling, you know, and the dynamite's burning, and then kaboom. And the great thing is is that I, I like to think that all the bone fragments would do a great job of just wiping out everybody on that wall. Right. If this is ever made into a movie, the, the uh, soundtrack should have Lou Reed's Perfect Day. 
playing in the background as this is like going on. <laughs> I also imagine another thing where you got these grown men with, you know, their M4s and all this shit, and they're just covered in, in fat shit, and they're just puking their guts out. <laughs> yeah, we got them on morale. Uh. Well, that's, that's just amazing. one thing I want to do. That's the one I want to just warm up with there. And, of nice. course, it has to be a really spectacular finale. Mm. Is there anything that scares you, Lawrence? Oh, it scares me is getting trapped in a situation like, a, you know, let's say you're out there and you're trying to survive. And then you... Then uh, you're like, oh, this community, it'll be great. Next thing you know, you're just basically a serf and a slave. And yeah. it's like... Mm. I would rather, I don't want to sound like some heroic libertarian, whatever the fuck, but, you know, it's just like, yeah, I'd rather take my chances with the goddamn zombies and, like, have a whip over me every day. Or basically, you know, they have all kinds of punishments if you don't come through. They got some kind of, I mean, this is stuff I'm still working through. Here. Mm, I, I at least, I, I would try to, like, establish a trade network with those assholes, but Ooh. other than that, I wouldn't, like... I wouldn't want to. I don't watch them. The Walking Dead, but isn't that kind of exactly like what's happening in The Walking Dead right now? Uh, yeah, they they are having a well. It's what you would expect in any post-apocalyptic situation. You're going to have these big, mean motherfucking alpha dogs, and the only mm. people who are going to do well at this are the meanest motherfuckers of all. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, you're going to have to deal with them. You could try and trade with them, or this guy can say, you know, no, 50% of everything is mine. You know? They're like <laughs> the Genghis Khan, so like basically. <laughs> well, you'd have to be their... You'd have to be you'd Genghis You'd have to be the Genghis Khan. to them. You'd have, you'd to, have to be fuck their shit the up. Conniest. Yeah. <laughs> you'd have to be ruthless, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. You'd have to become the monster you're fighting. Yeah. Mm. But well, that's the funny thing about the zombie apocalypse, uh, the genre altogether, is that uh, really, in the end, the biggest enemy are the other assholes out there, the other living humans. <laughs> yeah. They're the ones who complicate the shit for you every time. I mean, yeah, game back to the question, you know, what scares me? Yeah, it's being made into a slave by one of these assholes. Yeah. I mean, you know, imagine having, you know, being there, you know, with that, you know, in front of someone like Negan, and he's got a baseball bat, and he's telling you what it is, and it's like... Well, fuck, you know. <laughs> On the whole, I think I'd rather be back in Atlanta, you know, in that damn tank. <laughs> That's like, yeah, a couple and people. Watching my horse get eaten. You know? uh, a couple of my friends at work were talking about it, and they're like, why would you want to live the rest of your life as, like, just being a little bitch? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, like I said, you know, it's not some big heroic thing. It's like just, you know, what would you just rather do? And it's like some people, and some people would go for the safety. I would think so. I, I would think there would be some people. Like, yeah, there would cool be a lot that. of people who do that because it's the easy thing. Mm. Yup. Yeah, because thing, you know, because the hard thing is you're not just on the run from the Nazis. You're on the run from the warlords, the Negans, the whatever. You know. Right. Got to, you got to make sure you give those people a wide berth. You know, if nothing, yeah. you know, at best, you know, they don't even know you exist. Mm -hmm. You just ghost around these people. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, dude, Lawrence, could you read us some of your book? Uh, is it Grace Among the Dead? Yep. Yeah, I've been practicing this stuff of, you know, since my rig is different, I've been working with my microphone. I hope the sound's not too fucked up. Sounds amazing. Sounds great, I was going to ask, is this the new setup? Because I know you told me you were going to do the the Skype. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, dude. it's, uh, man, I've been meaning to do some stuff with just recording and so on, but uh, it's weird. I, I get to, I don't know. I get, I, I should drink more. I get stage fright. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am down to my last beer. <laughs> I, thought <I'd> just... <laughs> I thought I'd just read uh, from the first chapter, and uh, you know, I guess I'll keep an eye on the time where you can tell me when to stop. But it basically opens up right in the middle of the action. Grace Among the Dead begins uh, just, you know, Derek Grace has gotten back to the Colorado Springs area where he came from. And, of course, he's too late for his kids. His kids are gone. His wife died. And uh, he's just, he's depressed and fucked up. And he's basically holed up in a house outside of Falcon, Colorado, where he just basically takes painkillers and drinks and reads and just passes the time. Nice. 
Until, of course, something happens, which is in this first chapter. We'll awesome. start here. I'm at the drugstore in Falcon, Colorado, when the thing grabs my arm. The squeeze hurts like a mother. A debtor's muscles don't relax once they've got a hold. I jam my hunting knife into the woman's eye, working the blade until it finds whatever part of her brain keeps her up and she drops. The woman's grip pulls me to the floor with her as five of her office mates stumble up from outside. The first three struggle in the doorframe as either one tries to get in first. I stab into the woman's wrist, severing the tendons. Through the tingling of reawakening nerves, I shoulder her remains into the ankles of her office mates, now through the door and nearly on top of me. I run to the staff door beside the pharmacy. Locked. The service window is open, so I hop on the counter and butt slide over. After the damage I've taken, I need that Vicodin more than I'm when I started out this morning. Which I see has been cleaned out. Shit! Oxford blood smeared brown and black, their ragged ties stiff with old blood. Our first three office stooges get their numb, dead feet back under them. The two others behind them shuffle and growl for the delay. Now all five are reaching for me over the counter, trying to work out how to get over it without falling face forward and losing their footing again. Their craving to chew into my warm, living flesh will soon overcome the matter of their undead dignity. Here... With their arms outstretched, their heads laid out across the counter, these ghouls are all but offering themselves to me. I pull my panga from my belt. My beautiful panga, weapon of choice of the Rwandan genocide and the most invaluable souvenir of my Kansas adventure. My left arm is hobbled from the woman's crushing grip, so it's raw adrenaline driving its wide blade through the arms of the first two office stooges and the near hand of the third before sticking halfway through his other wrist. I used the jam blade to pull him towards me. I slip the claw hammer from my belt and swing it hard between his eyes. His wrist snaps away from the blade as he drops. The remaining two squall with rage, thumping their bleeding stumps uselessly on the counter as I deliver one, two hard taps and they fall. The last two approach the counter. I bend my knees slightly, drawing long breaths of hot, fetid air through my nose. I feel the crushing pain in my arm, the queasiness in my belly. May I help the next customer, please? I switch hands with the panga and the hammer, slicing through the arms of the first office stooge and chopping into the neck of the second. I switch the hammer to my right hand and fling it across his temple. His hand tumbles away, smacking wetly upon the floor. As the corpse gravy begins to gurgle over his neck stump, I'm... I'm making a neat crater between the eyes of his buddy. He's been bellowing something fierce since I sliced off his hands. No telling how many others have heard him. I turn back to the inventory. I find half a tray of Percocet. Whoever got here before me got the popular stuff. Gotta admit, nothing Big Farmer offered back in the day could give you such a good, clean, happy-to-be-alive buzz like a Viking of beer. Beer is no longer an option, of course. At least I have something so this arm won't keep me up all night. I grab some antibiotics on the way out, hoping I won't have to use them, but because they're probably no good anyway. Pretty soon none of these pills will be any good. Sucks to be us. While bagging my groceries in Ziplocs and dropping them into the pockets of my hunting vest, I see another woman and her two orbiters groping at the pharmacy drive through window. The loud clunka clunka of one pulling at the emergency exit door will draw even more of Falcon's former citizens here. I've gotten everything I need here, so I leave through the front. Stepping into the blazing sunlit parking lot, I marvel at how often I'm able to leave the same way I came in the most days, most of these days. I suppose that's something. Hot as it, hot as it is, I'm guessing it's already July. Unless they're sure of someone to eat, the dead tend to sit out the hottest part of the day in the shade which means I have no trouble making my way back to the big yellow truck. That is, until I actually get there to find your standard issue mentally ill homeless thing in an army jack and a Charles Manson beard pawing at the passenger side door. This pisses me off just as much as if he was alive and begging for cigarettes and change instead of gobstopping mouthfuls of soft tissue from around my collarbone. Seriously, get your booger hooks off my goddamn truck. I jog up to it. It moans loudly as it senses my approach. I slash and hit it in two clean motions. I leap to the chrome runner and pull at the passenger door. I'm sure I didn't lock this. I thumb the button on my remote and yank the door open. 
please, says the woman from the door, from the floor in the front of the seat. God damn it. I can hear the shuffling, scraping approach of the others. I slam the door and run around to the driver's side. I pull myself up into the cab and start the engine. Sit up and put your seatbelt on now. I've already got the truck in reverse so I can bump the walkers shambling up behind us. I roll over them twice before spinning a tire on one. I've got more coming in from the front. Five, now seven. Twelve. I plow into the thickest part of the ghouls, knocking them down upon one another before reversing into another three following too closely. There's some bumping and dipping in the back. An industrious bubba in crusty gore-blackened overalls has clambered up into the flatbed. The woman next to me shrieks. Do that again and I swear to God I'll feed you to them. Her eyes bulge, brimming with tears. Uh, I'm sorry, she says. Don't be sorry. Be quiet. I turn around to see more raggedy, chewed over once people pulling themselves up into the flatbed. I let my foot off the brake, coaxing the truck over the ones I've knocked over. I reverse again to make those on the tailgate fall face forward into the flatbed. I stop to let some more climb up. No one wants to miss the lunch wagon. Your eyes still open? I ask my stowaway. She whimpers. Good. Make yourself useful and count the ones I finish off. I drive out of the parking lot with maybe 18 or 20 rotters clinging around the truck and in the flatbed. You can feel them weighing down the chassis. If this was an ordinary car, we'd be so much tenderized meat pulled through the busted safety glass. A young man in a wife beater and board shorts falls away from the front grill. I don't feel anything under the tire, so he misses getting run over. The bug-eyed woman at the passenger side beating on the window and making ow, ow noises is flicked off as I bang through one of the deeper potholes on this crumbling street. The rest are hanging tough. Good for them. I turn right. The road looks clear, but that's going to last one minute, two at best, before the inhabitants of the neighborhoods to either side come pouring out at the sound of my engine. I bring the truck up to 50 miles per hour, careful not to pull away so fast that the ones in the flatbed fall back. No, I want them all leaning forward, trying to hold on, trying to get at all the living, breathing, meaty goodness in the cab. I'm up to 65 before I hit the brakes. Not too hard, this thing is too easy to flip. Just enough to send these ugly waste of skin sailing over the cab. Once I'm sure we've slowed enough, I cut the wheel to send the ones we've slammed into the back window tumbling over the side. Their heads crack on the white asphalt and they're done. Assholes in suits, assholes in t-shirts and jeans, at least one dress. No, make that two, plus a pantsuit. How many, I ask my new companion. Nine down for sure. I see five others. They're crawling. Good. The impact breaks bones in every one of them. The ones I miss splitting open their skulls in the westbound lanes have one or no legs to walk with. Most don't even have intact arms with which to pull themselves along. They twitch furiously, their broken, useless limbs hanging lip beside their torn bodies. I turn the truck back towards Falcon, aiming at the big tires at the head aiming my big tires at the heads of the floppers and crawlers. Sclutch, snap, sclutch, snap, poppin' bubble wrap. I've got to make two more turnarounds on the road to get them all. My new companion makes a sound. I, she says, what? I, speak up, damn it. I think, no, there's one still in the back. There. I glance at the rear view. Son of a bitch. I stop the truck and get out. I walk back and pull down the tailgate. A teenage boy kicks and thrashes the old blood stiff on what's left of a designer brand shirt. His parents put some money into his wardrobe. I wonder if they got their faces chewed off for their trouble. The boy's mouth has the usual telltale scabbing about it. He's been eating someone. He won't be reaching out for me, though. He's dislocated his shoulders holding onto the lip of the flatbed. That death grip apparently works against them sometimes. I step back and he kicks and snaps after me. He worms over the tailgate and face plants to the asphalt. He lifts his damaged face up from the pavement by his neck and gnashes broken teeth at me. I slam the tailgate shut and nudge the boy's head. I climb into my truck and shift into reverse. I hardly feel the bump as I put the truck into drive and roll over it again on my way towards town. 
I see lines of walkers coming in from the surrounding fields. Where do you want me to drop you off, I say, staring around the crashing intersection. A gray woman in a tattered bathrobe lurks behind a minivan, but she backs away as I approach. What? No. Well, not here, obviously. The dead from miles around heard the banshee screech of the tires where I slung the last of the locals from the flatbed. The early arrivers, the early arrivals are stepping off the curb and crowding into the road. So far, they're hesitant to step directly in front of the truck. One tries to stumble run aside, alongside. I slow to match his speed, then swing my door open on him. He flips to the side in a neat arc. He might cartwheel on his outstretched arms and legs if he had better motor control. <laughs> he doesn't. You're not going to put me out here, are you? I can hear the near panic in her voice. So what you're saying is you've got no one around here, is that it? I, I have some things in a place. Somewhere it's... Where is it? No, you can't drop me off. I stomp the brake, slamming us forward against our seat belts. Even so, we're pushed forward a smidge as the parade of former citizens behind us barked their kneecaps on the bumper and slammed our heads into the tailgate. Loud, piteous moans erupt behind us as the fallen are trampled by their brothers and sisters bringing up the rear, using their bodies to step up into the flatbed. My stowaway squares her back between the seat and the door frame. She ignores the slapping on her window from the once pretty lady missing half of her face, who has climbed up into the booster rail on her side. It's not human, the woman says. You can't put a defenseless... Now her big, watery brown eyes are all about the flat black barrel of my Glock. I could rack the slide for effect like they used to do in the movies, and I'm sure it would be the only thing she'd hear, too, beside all the slapping and thumping about the truck. All she needs to hear, though, is this. You do not climb into my truck unasked and tell me what to do. I... Shut up! I'll be fighting for my life against mobs of walkers you'll bring straight to us because you can't stay quiet and you can't stay still. I'll be good, she says. To apologize is to lay the foundation for a future offense, I say, quoting Ambrose Bierce. I'll make a deal with you. Don't ask questions. Don't talk. I'll take you to where I'm staying and we'll get you something to eat. After that, we'll decide on where you need to go. Lawrence. She sinks back. Oh. Huh? I'm sorry, <laughs> dude. I thought... I was hoping that was a pause. We could, we could end this. Not that I want to end this. Oh, that night's no, cool. <laughs> but dude, we have to wrap it up. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, good. I, I was, I just got lost and lost track of the time. So, oh, dude, I, I could have listened to that. I could have listened to way more of that, dude. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I'm hoping it uh, sets the mood for the Halloween show. I mean, of course, you already had bleeding critic on <laughs> how was he by the way oh he's fantastic man he wrote a story just to read on our show like it, it was great it was great oh he's got the goods i don't know if you've seen his website but yes. my god dude he is the real <laughs> deal the real deal i told my barber about him and like he just had to see the interview we had with him the last time he is as he said the only real horror clown yes he <laughs> is the one and only. He puts in the goddamn work, I'll say that. Yeah. Holy shit, it's astonishing. He, yeah. yeah, he is outstanding, but I so mean, are he you, dude. It. I mean, he lives and breathes it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is I, not a hobby. Yeah, yeah. I, I assume he just goes to the grocery store in the mass and that's just <laughs> every day for Bleeding Critic. <laughs> 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 Probably sleeps with the mask on. <laughs> yeah. But, dude, I hope everybody runs out to get your book because I hope, like us, I hope they can't wait to hear more of that, to read more of that. Well, I appreciate the encouragement. I, I mean, I'll have to record this and put it up then. Uh, like I said, I just kind of, you know, I was nervous as hell before doing it, and then I get oh. into it, and it's like... Ugh. You got to do your own <laughs> audio book. That's what you got to do, man, because it, it's great with you reading it. So that's encouraged. Like I said, I'm glad for the encouragement because I look at people like Bleeding cr Critic and it's like, shit, I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, my, my girlfriend just messaged me. She just said, I wish I had time to read because she wants to read your books and she loves zombies. She loves a zombie apocalypse type story. 
well, I'll just have to come on and just read a little bit more every time, and then after a while, you know, we'll have that audio book. <laughs> we'll just book a show for you for yes! like five hours. You can just read. And we'll <laughs> <laughs> I would listen to it. History Science Theater 3000 stuff, you know. And she said, <laughs> too, and I loved it, too, how you go into the characters. is It's, it's just fucking amazing, yeah. dude. It's spot on. It helps to drink a lot of beer and yeah. pace the floor and do the voices and you know because you got you need to try and make it sound realistic. Of course, I'm reading through this and it's like ah oh, shit, man. I don't know. I might want to change that one. But... <laughs> Where can everybody find your stuff, dude? Uh, Amazon.com. Awesome. Yep, awesome. I get a Kindle ebook or you can get the paperback. Uh, most people get the ebook. That's fine. I actually make more money off the ebooks. I don't know how that fucking works, but. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank but you. There it is. Thank you so much, dude. Oh, thank you guys. And uh, you guys have an excellent Halloween. You have a better one. You do, man. Happy Halloween. All right, I'm going to be looking forward to listening to the finished product here. Awesome. All you right. You too, brother. Have a good one, man. All right, you too. All right, later. Later, dude.